a story. A king was once looking out over his kingdom. He saw peace, health, and commerce, people from every village. His vizier handed him tea and honey, and when he put the honey in, a blob fell right on the sill, the window sill. Oh, your majesty, let me have that clean. It's only a drop of honey. And the honey oozed down the side of the palace, and it fell right in the dirt. And immediately, of course, ants, bees, flies, and a bird seeing its lunch went, whoosh, oh, your majesty, let me have that cleaned up. It is only nature we are seeing. But a cat seeing its lunch jumped off its mistress's lap, and then a dog seeing his nemesis jumped on the cat. Well, the cat lady got a stick and protected her cat and whacked the dog. The dog owner came and pushed the cat lady. Your majesty, let me call the guards. It's just some peasants arguing. But then all the people from the cat lady village started to move in. So all the people from the dog village started to come against them. Well, uh, maybe we uh, should call the guards. But it was too late. Because by that time, they had sent back to their villages, and everyone had come to protect their own people. And by the end of the day, death and devastation was all the king could see. I should have paid more attention to the drop of honey. Now that's the kind of story I used to tell in hopes that people would take up environmental stewardship. And that was until I really did some homework. And that's where homework around climate left me. Oh, I don't like the word climate change, because change feels like it's inevitable, like my wife's going through the change. So you think like what, the earth is gonna like get cranky and sweaty for three years and then bulge around the equator? Not. What I found out was so much more dire than what we're ever told, that we are on the brink of extinction. Now, this is not my usual modality. That's my usual modality. I'm an environmental ranter. As a matter of fact, when I'm ranting, I have a very different skill set than the storytelling, because I can clear a room, an office building, yet yeah, during a Pats Jets game, <laughs> when I start ranting. My ever present sister will be sitting across the table from me and excuse me sir you don't want to order that steak bad pasturing is causing desertification and you can get more protein from lentils and you boys should not be driving SUVs you should be riding bicycles do you know you're spewing exhaust and it's fossil fuel burning and greenhouse gases and ladies plastic bottles with water police endocrine disrupting chemicals come off of that and my sister is like shaking me and going Jody Jody shut Nobody cares. And I figure she's kind of right. Because we have, with some horror, gotten used to and simply started to acclimate for what's happening. Extreme weather conditions, flooding, disease-borne insects. How many of you know somebody who has had Lyme or has Lyme? It wasn't even a diagnosis 50 years ago. And why do we have this? Here's the line. Because there's more water. Because the glaciers and caps are melting, and the glaciers and caps are melting because we keep burning fossil fuel, and it enters the system as greenhouse gases, which act as a great blanket, and we are, yeah. And we know it. Everybody knows it. And we acclimate. But then I found out the two things that left me on the couch. And I thought, I'll talk to my sister about these. So when we burn through a lot of money during the month, you know how you get your credit card at the end of the month and you go, well, let's look at the damages. Well, when we burn through fossil fuels, the bill, the damages don't come for 50 years. That's how long it takes to impact on climate. So all those things we're seeing now that's from what we burnt 50 years ago. And we've burnt twice as much in this last 50. And yet you think you could still keep the genie in the bottle, except, isn't that beautiful? That's the permafrost. Covers 20 to 25% of the Earth's surface, frozen bogs for 11,000 years. 
and you see the mystical stuff sort of frozen in it? That's methane. Methane is a greenhouse gas 21 times more potent than carbon dioxide. And there are millions of tons of it frozen under the permafrost, which is now starting to break up. And when it melts, and that methane enters the system with the other greenhouse gases, the planet warms more, more permafrost melts, more methane goes up, the earth warms more. And that's a vicious cycle that we don't know how to break. And then the genie is out of the bottle. Any wonder? My husband would come over with tea and Prozac, and you know, I would mutter, yeah, like psychiatrists are going to make this an official diagnosis, so it'll have a code and they can prescribe for a disease called climate despair. And then the only thing in the world that could have got me off the couch was coming to town. When I was pregnant with my son, I am sure the great creator said, hey, Look at that self-righteous, kosher, pacifist, feminist, vegetarian. <laughs> Let's give her this one. <laughs> he has taken me everywhere, including understanding that there can be a lot of integrity in many arms of the US government and military. He has been my great gift and teacher. And he was bringing Miss Caroline. Now, it took a while for us to figure that Miss Caroline was indeed always the smartest person in the room because she never bragged. She never one-upped anybody, so it was subtle. And when I figured it out, I fell in love with her. And so did he. <laughs> they got married this fall. And they came. And when you're in utter despair, you don't know what's coming out of your eyes or nose or mouth or ears. But Caroline and I were cleaning up one night, and she says to me, so, would you counsel that we don't have children? There were no words. Just a Wampanoag creation myth. In the beginning, the creator made first man and first woman, and they had children. And their children had children, and the creator said, you may choose to have children or not. I love you all. And those who chose had children. And those who chose their children, children had children and their children. And you know how that works, you know. Until the creator said, all right, my planet is full. You must make a decision. We can leave it exactly the way it is for eternity, or we can have some kind of window in and out. You decide. So as their way, the men had one circle and the women had another. And it took the men about... 12 seconds, and they said, we like it, we like it, creator, it's good, we're strong, we're healthy, food, fun, Whoa, leave it. But the women took longer. And the women who had given birth or seen that miracle, the ones who had held a new infant with all the possibilities of this life, they weren't going to deny that to someone else. So, honey, do you know who won? <laughs> because we have a window in called birth and a window out called as it was, as it is, as it ever should be. I wanted them to have a greatest gift and teacher. And so it was time to get my behind off that couch. Now, I have told thousands of stories. But this was not the time to tell. It was the time that I needed to hear stories. Stories of hope and action. And I found they were everywhere. They were next door. In my town, there's a guy named Chip Osborne. He owned um, a big plant shop and a nursery. And he loved his dog. And when his dog was diagnosed with cancer tumors through the whole poor baby, he was bereft. But when the dog's pup died a few months later, of the same tumors, he started to look. And he realized he used every single agrochemical he'd ever been taught about as miracles in school. And that his dogs had been sleeping where the runoff from the fungicide was. He'd killed his own dogs. Chip went organic the next day. And he didn't stop there. 
He worked with an organization in town and they lobbied for all organic public land maintenance. Now he has become a national consultant working in the White House and other places, one of the best known people to consult on organic turf maintenance. So he took his skill set and he affected his community and his world. And I'm figuring that all of us function in sort of four concentric worlds that we can affect. The first one is that national, international world. And most of us aren't like Chip. You know, our skill set isn't going to allow us to touch the world, but there are brilliant organizations out there. Each one of them has their story, their style, and their mission. And there will be one that you really resonate with. Hello, and welcome to the trustees of the reservation walk through conservation land. There are people who just do conservation and education. And if that's your skill set and style, that's an organization you can join. If you channel Aaron Brockovich and you want to hold people's feet to the fire, government, industry, business, bingo, there are organizations that do it and they're lobbying for much, much stronger emission standards, which we have to have. They're bridge builders. They're folks who understand that there is no room or time to demonize people in this battle. We have to ally them. So imagine, we know you gentlemen have created an incredible electric grid. And we'll always need people to collect and distribute power. But let me show you how you really want to start to transfer that immediately over to renewable sources. Because there will be no food down the fossil fuel hole. They're doing that. And finally, my fave, the direct action people. The, their, um, their actions off the coast of Washington with people in their canoes. There's actions here where people literally are throwing themselves on the cement and saying, you are not digging up here to put in a great piece of piping for gas. Don't worry, there's a handout when you leave with all of these on them. <laughs> the next level is community, because you've heard the saying, all politics are local. And there are people who will share goals with you and goals that you could not achieve alone. And again, in my very own neighborhood, 17 years ago, a group of women were standing in Norma Warren's backyard. They had just come from her funeral where she had been buried. She had died of breast cancer in her early 50s. And these women, I mean, Norma was an avid exerciser, a health food person. She had none of the markers for breast cancer. And so every one of these women said, it could happen to us, and we loved her. And, and so they each became a link, trying to figure out why Norma Warren got breast cancer. And they looked at the water, the air, but what they discovered was that upwind from us was one of the dirty five power plants, coal to energy, the Salem power plant. And it was spewing cadmium, fly ash, lead, mercury, all onto our lawns, our clothes, our lungs. And they organized and became HealthLink. They were a thorn in the side of that plant. They educated the community. They worked with Chip Osborne to get organic land maintenance. And they are still activists today for detoxification and keeping fossil fuels in the ground. A story. My husband will often say, honey, please don't hang the laundry. The towels feel like sandpaper. My shirts have wrinkles. <laughs> honey. Do you understand that coal, creating cold or heat calls the most energy? Now we got the sun in the morning and the wind in the noontime. I don't want to be, please. Do you really think anything you do is going to make a difference? That hurt. But here's what I figured out. And I said to him, I don't know. But I have to live with me. So we hang the laundry. <laughs> um, there are a thousand little things that you can do every single day that's your vote to keep it in the ground. That's your vote to detoxify your world. Uh, don't worry, they're on the handout. And you can choose from those, but you might also choose something from your own very specific skill set. You might, like my friend David, he maintains a big office building in Watertown. And he realized that the generator on the roof was only getting 75% efficiency. He built a closet for it and insulated it. He now gets 95% efficiency. And he'll teach anyone to do it. When you leave, you're going to see this tasteful sign made from recycled things. And what I invite you to do is to think about 
what organizations might you be comfortable joining? What might you want to create or be part of in your community? What personal behaviors or changes might you want to make based on your passion and your skill sets? Write it down on the little post-it note and um, put it up there. That's the most important one. Because if you don't have a story that keeps you motivated, you know, we don't do things because we should, unless you're really elevated. We do things because we want. And if you don't have a personal story that keeps you active in this fight for survival, you won't stay there. I want a planet that can nurture life. Because I know two brilliant, wonderful people that want to bring life to it. What's your story?